Hey, welcome back, traders. It's John. It's April 12th, Friday. It's time for a general market update. Get a reminder, I'm an individual growth stock investor. Okay, what we're going to cover today is we're going to get into the indices, the market breadth, as we always do. And then I've got a segment called the other AI infrastructure. And then we're going to go over a few growth names to maybe keep your eye on. And then we'll uh, call it a weekend wrap up. So just a reminder, if anyone is interested in ranking insights, the website that will be launched somewhere around June 1st, if you want to be part of the early bird offering, uh, please send me an email to support at rainkinginsights.com. And thank you for everyone that has done that so far. Okay, market breadth. All right, here's the NASDAQ composite at about 235 today. Um, fairly straightforward. Um, you know, we've had a lot of distribution over the last probably four to six weeks. And if I just drew a line across here, we've basically made no net price progress in over six weeks. It's pretty much been chopped sideways. A couple attempts to uh, move to new high ground were rejected. Um, and generally, you can just see the volume pattern down here. Higher volume on the down days and lower volume on the up days. It's just not good price action. Um, you know, this is a look at the number of NASDAQ stocks above the 50 day moving average. It's only 38%. It's been eroding for um, the last six weeks. And you can see we're actually at a new low being at 38. We haven't been that low in a long time. So we've known about this deterioration going on. We've been talking about it for probably six weeks now. You're looking at the new highs and new lows on the NASDAQ. You know, some of the leading stocks are still holding together, but the the evidence says that much of the NASDAQ is really struggling. Um, they're deteriorating. There's distribution. Um, so it's not a great picture. And we've talked about this um, could be a correction, um, could be a correction more in time uh, versus price. I mean, we're right around the 50-day moving average right now. It's possible that we could just chop along here, which is really um, pretty dangerous for a position trader to try and trade during a chop period. So we just have to be patient to get the conditions uh, more or to our liking. This is the breadth on the S&P 500. So the black line is the S&P as a line chart. Again, looking at the 50-day moving average, you can see that even the S&P, which has been the strongest of the indexes, um, has been deteriorating. There's only 56% of the S&P above the 50-day moving average, and we're almost to making a new low. And if you look a little broader at a longer time frame, 73% is still above the 200-day. Now, looking at the new highs and new lows on the New York Stock Exchange, and I've just taken this and blown it up to a little bigger size here to illustrate my point, you can see that even new lows are starting to pick up on the S&P. Um, so it's spillage of the deterioration is coming over into the, um, the broader S&P. Um, and you, if you really want to study it, if you look at the last three rally attempts in price and you look at the new highs, um, each rally attempt has had lower and lower number of new highs, which is um, not a good condition um, for the market. So the breadth is starting to deteriorate on the S&P, which was the leading index. Now, looking at the Dow Jones, the Dow Jones Industrials, you can see here on price, um, we're below, rolling right below the 50-day. You know, today's a bad day for the Dow. And I've pulled up two other industrial ETFs, the S&P XLI, looks like it's starting to roll down. And the XLB, which is materials, is also rolling down with the industrials. So again, not a good picture to see these breaking um, some key support. So coming back to the S&P 500, just want to put some markers on this in terms of some pullback levels. Um, so far, we've pulled back about 3%, really normal. Um, we're down to about the 50-day moving average in red. Um, the thing I really don't like to see are these wide ranges, these red bars, these reversals. And even today, um, I believe it was a gap down at the open and continued. Um, and we're I'm recording this about 3.35 Eastern time. So doesn't look like a good close. Uh, the next level really of support could be the 5,000 level in the S&P, which would be about a 5% pullback. 
still wouldn't be horrible. I could see the S&P, you know, meandering its way down and finding some support. Again, we might get more of a correction in time um, versus depth. Um, but if things really were to deteriorate further, an 8% pullback brings us all the way back down to where we were um, into mid-January. So just some levels to keep an eye on as, as things develop. So let's move to this segment I'm calling the other AI infrastructure. So when we think of uh, AI infrastructure in the past, uh, I don't know, year to 18 months, the buzz has all been about the chip stocks and probably the server rack stocks. And then everybody says, well, that's the infrastructure for AI. And it is. Those are the chips that allow AI to process all these computations. And we think of companies like NVIDIA and AMD and Broadcom and Vertiv and SMCI with their um, efficient rack uh, solutions. So we think of that, but there's another build out of the AI revolution, that's infrastructure. So I wanted to take a look at it. There was a recent Yale University article in February, and it really, the article was focused on artificial intelligence for the point of view that, you know, the footprint is going to get larger and larger as it rolls out. And then we're talking a rollout over, you know, 5, 10, 15 years. But right now we're in that early stage of infrastructure. And the article pointed out the massive energy that is really required to do all this computation as well as all of the data storage. And it talked about um, the millions and millions of gallons of water that are needed to cool all the heat generated from this energy of computation and storage. And the article featured um, a professor, Shaoli Ren, who was an associate professor of electrical and computer engineering at UC Riverside, and he's, he's been studying water costs associated with all this computation for the past decade. Now, based on calculations of annual water use for cooling systems by Microsoft, Ren estimates that a person, a single person asking chat GBT 10 to 50 questions throughout the day um, uses about a half liter of water. Now, we know also that in the article, it points out that, you know, these GPU chips um, are more efficient than other chips for, for processing AI computation. But the real efficiency achieved by these GPUs is when they're run in very large cloud data centers. The bigger, the better. Typical data centers might be 100,000 square feet, but now the build out is they're building hyperscale uh, data centers, which are, could be over a million square feet. So they're huge. Now you can say, wow, that's really, really efficient for the GPUs, but it's intensity of energy used to run a hyperscale center that is um, associated with this large infrastructure build out. International Energy Association or Energy Agency is pointing out that data centers electricity consumption in 2026 will be double that of 2022, up to 1,000 terawatts. To give it some scale, that's roughly Japan's total um, electricity consumption. So we're talking very large um, electricity needs. Now, Google's data centers used about 20% more water in 2022 versus 21. They used about 5 billion gallons of water. Now, what's really noteworthy is the water that's used in these data centers needs to be pure. It needs to be clean. Um, and so basically that puts it in competition with the water that we're using every day for drinking and cooking and washing. So there's gonna be a huge demand on water for cooling. Microsoft's water usage rose by 34% in the past year. Now we're very, very early in this build out. It's gonna be a multi-year build out of these massive hyperscale centers. And even the article pointed out, it's very difficult to get the exact data that these companies are using. They're not exactly forthright with wanting to tell you what they're using because I think some of the numbers are staggering. Um, and climate change impact has largely been ignored. So I, I think this is gonna, you know, the climate thing will probably be addressed. It'll lead to new innovations um, and probably new companies. But at the same time, 
Um, this is, there's huge demand. So let's look at some of this as it relates to the stock market. Um, so I've just pulled up a number of groups. These are groups that are really part of this infrastructure, the other infrastructure, electric power, water and pollution control, metals, as well as air conditioning and cooling needs. So you can see here, the black line is the S&P 500, which is basically stalled out. As you can see, it's pretty much going horizontal. But you'll notice that these groups that I've put on this graph, um, since early February, they are all uptrending and outperforming the S&P. So let's dig a little deeper and look at some of the companies um, that compose some of these groups. So the electric power group, believe it or not, is number 26 in the IBD rankings. And so you can see here, since this is since January, generally the trend has been pretty strong with these companies. You've got Hubble, who makes all kinds of electrical components, gear, wire, Quanta Services, PWR. They are a large um, contractor that builds these large electrical grids and a large of these power stations, et cetera. We're probably all familiar with Vertiv. Um, with its intensity inside the data and server centers, with their cooling systems and power systems, and there's others, but they're performing well, believe it or not. Now, they're not exactly growth stocks when you think of the electric power group, but they are certainly having demand and institutions are putting money into these groups. Here's alternative utility power group. It's still a lowly 124, but again, since February, right when the indexes of growth started to stall out, you can see that the power, alternative power groups have been performing. Constellation Energy has um, nuclear interests. Cameco is a nuclear uranium company. Um, so there's a bunch of intensity of electrical power companies and alternative energy companies that are doing well. So on the right side here, we have the metals group, number 44 in the ranking. So it's a pretty good group right now. Um, you know, all this electrical wire is a lot of copper and a lot of metals to do all these basically build out and infrastructure build out. So some of the metals companies like Freeport, McNaran, Tech Resources, and certainly Southern Copper have been in demand. And you can see for the last six weeks, eight weeks, these companies have been very much outperforming. Now, on the cooling side, I've listed a bunch of the names over here, train, et cetera, comfort systems. Um, they have been performing well since the follow through day, way back into November, as you can see here, but they've been quote, cooling lately. They've been kind of going sideways um, the past month. So, um, you know, we don't think of these groups as growth groups, but I thought it was worth bringing to your attention. They may be appropriate for a, for a trade or a play uh, if you're really thinking about the longer term with AI infrastructure, um, not only chips and servers, but the power and the grids and the metals um, will likely do well given the demand. So let's switch, switch back to what we really are probably interested in, which are growth stocks. And I just put together a couple of growth ideas, not that I think the environment is um, conducive, but we always wanna keep our watch list ready. So everybody's got their eyes on NVIDIA, um, but just to kind of look at the action, we looked at this a few weeks ago and we said maybe we'd get a little bit of a sandwich between the thousand level and the two trillion level. Um, the stock came back, pulled back. This jagged uh, avocado line is actually the 10 week moving average as opposed to the red line, which is the 50 day moving average. It touched the 10 week pretty much perfectly, kissed it, and we're getting a rebound off that line, which is what you'd expect for a leading stock like NVIDIA. So it's doing what we thought it might do. It did this at the 500 zone. It looks to be kind of basing out. Here's Kava. So this is a real you know, new company, new merchandise on the market. Greg Morton talked about this um, in some detail at the meetup on Wednesday, but I thought the chart looked interesting. This is part of a large cup with handle base. This was the lip of that pivot point. Stock made a nice move came back into the 50 day, which is his first trip. Um, the 10 week again shown in the uh, gold color here, um, got some support. So that's a good sign for a, for a young company like Kava getting some support, maybe an opportunity either builds out a base or if the market were to reverse and take off, it might be something to consider. Now switching to a couple of weekly charts that have been acting real well, 
This is Axon Enterprises. Um, I've kind of shown this on a weekly chart so we can see the base that it came out of. And the base had a very strong move. It was up seven weeks in a row coming out of that base, which is shown in the blue box. And then it consolidated with these little tight weeks. These little blue dots here are showing tight weeks. There's three weeks tight here, there's three weeks tight here. And then the stock had an earnings gap. And now it's been going sideways as the um, 10 week moving line catches up to the stock. And again, there's close, there's a little flat base here with some tight closes, good action um, from Axon. So that's one to keep um, your eye on. It's relative strength line is probably improving with the market correcting. Uber, we've been keeping an eye on Uber. There's a weekly chart. You can see the run-up had two multiple weeks in a row groupings. One here, then it went tight, then it moved up again for another five, six weeks. Really good action. And it's kind of came back and now it's drifted into the, the 10 week, getting some support. It's trying to hold some support in here. It's being tested, but uh, generally it looks to be uh, normal so far. Some other stocks to keep on your watch list, um, showing some decent relative strength right now, Qualcomm, Chipotle, Coin, Spotify, Arm, ASML, Dash, App, and Wing all look to be constructive so far. But there are some leaders that are really starting to break down. AMD in the last two weeks has really um, not done well. It's breaking down. Deckers, which has been a leader in the market, has really shown some negative action and uh, ANET is getting hit today. So keep your watch list fresh, looking for stocks that are showing relative strength as we pull in, because that'll be a big clue to who might lead on the next leg up. So let's get to our wrap up. So how are we doing our percent decline? Well, the pullback is clearly in motion. Um, we're below the 20 day moving average. Um, you know, key levels are, um, the 50 day is probably the key level now to look at. If it holds the 50 day, that would be normal. As I said, maybe we correct more in time by going sideways and that means chop, which is dangerous for position traders. Um, there's clearly institutions and the markets are repositioning. There's a lot of rotations going on out there given the, the war situation globally. Um, the CPI data you know, says it's hot. The PPI data says things are okay. So. You know, all these institutional forecasts for rate cuts were clearly wrong. They were predicting cuts aggressively starting in March. And then they said, no, they're going to really be aggressive in June. And now, you know, it's all being pushed out, um, given the, the uh, mixed reports that we're getting. So it's not clear. So it's definitely a fog. The question really remains is the institutions bought positions aggressively in November, December, and they started to cool off in January, February. Will the institutions use the pullback to reload up on building their growth positions, assuming cuts are going to come, whatever it is, six or nine months from now? Or do we see the market start to really break down because they forecast maybe some things, some worse things are ahead and they take more defensive positions? So we'll have to see how it plays out. The 20 day, we're below the 20 day, which re really tells us that at a minimum, we're pulling back and that it could be a change of trend completely. So we have to be open to both. We'll watch the levels for pullbacks. The power trend is still um, barely in place. The 20 is still above the 50, but it's um, definitely gonna be tested soon. Now the new highs and new lows is giving us a very weak picture. You can look at the NASDAQ and now even the S&P is not showing great new highs and new lows. So the action of leading stocks um, you know, we're starting to lose some of the leaders. So that's concerning. Um, other leaders have already been correcting and building bases. So we want to, um, you know, keep our eyes on the relative strength names. You know, exposure levels, again, 10 to 15% is a defensive posture. That's what I think you should be at, particularly really only holding stocks that you have big cushion in. You know, the one thing you do control is you control the dial on how much exposure you have to the market. So I'm just showing here a little tone dial from a guitar. You know, it doesn't feel like right now you should be in overdrive um, in guitar speak. The tone should be lower. You should be much more defensive, um, probably not initiating new positions if you are a position trader. Um, maybe you take a few shots if you're a swing trader. Quote of the week. Three men came to Wall Street. The first always knew what was the best buy. The second knew why it was the best buy. 
but the third knew neither of these things. He only knew when to buy. He made the most money. That's Richard Wyckoff from the uh, early 1900s. And I think the message is we got to be patient when the market environment is not conducive to our time frame. We need to know when to buy. And so it's position traders. A heavy cash position is probably the right place right now. So let's take our, our words of wisdom from Wyckoff this week. That's the general market update. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. It's April 12th, 2024.